This talks about a process which has been a mystery and a great discussion in physics for quite a long time, for close to a century, since quantum mechanics first uh, started becoming something that it was clear was a good approximation, at least at the very least, of how nature works. And that's on the nature of quantum coherence and quantum collapse. You have this very mysterious process going on by which if, if, if a quantum mechanic, if we're designing a, a quantum device, then a lot of the transport through those things, a lot of trouble is taken to make the transport through these devices coherent. What does that mean? It means that the, the wave function evolves in a way which is, which is um, deterministic. But then whenever we try and look at a quantum state, that quantum state appears to collapse, to have a quantum collapse, a, uh, a reduction to a state which is localized within the absorber, within the observer's universe. I want to talk about that today, and I'm going to talk about that in relation to a few fundamental quantities. One of those is inversion. In fact, inversion is the key central point of this talk. Another one is invariance, which turns out to be related to the process of inversion, in that in inversion one comes up with invariance. And this leads also to the idea of interaction, an action between an emitter and an absorber, how that takes place in a quantum system. Now, I'm going to talk about quantum systems mostly of light, but this applies also to, um, and they've started talking about those things in his talk yesterday, to electrons. And uh, I may um, dip into those or perhaps come into them in the discussion afterwards as well, although the talk is primarily about photons today. Now, um, the authors of this talk are Martin uh, van der Mark, uh, and myself, and I'll put Martin first on this one because he was um, going to be the lead person on a paper pertaining to this, and that paper is an unpublished paper up on the Quisical website. Now, what I'm going to talk about as well is I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about space and time. I'm going to talk about rulers and clocks. And I'm going to talk about the kind of talks that clock, rulers and clocks that physicists talk, that talk about. That's continuous ones. But I'm also going to talk about discrete, the way this fits over to discrete systems. The tick and the tock and the ruler clocks, which Martin and I used to shorten just to rocks. So I'm going to talk about tick, tock and rocks. And the old instruction, of course, from caveman time is keep banging the rocks together, folks. We're going to do a bit of rock banging here today. So the key key word for this whole thing is inversion and what that means in the physics of an inversion. We all know, we all have an idea about what the mathematics of an inversion means, but I'm going to try and relate that to what the physics of an inverse system means physically. But there are other key words as well that are important. Interaction, quantum collapse, of course, invariance, but also the usual resonance, harmony and coherence. How do states fit together? How do they cohere across space and time over large distances, which they do in the quantum system? And the um, picture here in the middle is that, is that of a photon, a single wavelength of an absolute relativistic photon, which we'll talk about later. So the summary, I'm going to go through a quick summary of what the talk will be about. We're going to consider within um, uh, the new theory of, um, of uh, matter and light, d mu psi g is equal to zero, which I've talked about in a previous talk. I'm not going to dwell too much on that because information's out there already, or the, um, a, a, a summary of the, uh, of the uh, theory is already out there on the Quisical website. But what we're going to talk about today is that theory, and then the mathematics, and Innes and, uh, and Arnie and myself sat down for some time to find a, a method of calling this something useful, and we quite quickly got towards Martin's name, and we ended up with the mathematics of absolute relativity theory in nature, which is Martin. It's Martin mathematics that we're going to talk about. Very appropriate. I'm going to talk about the way in which the continuous way in which a electron wave function or electron-like wave function can generate a photon-like wave function. What is the interaction? What is that thing that allows an electron within the new theory to emit and absorb photons? How does that process work? Now, the standard way of doing this is say, okay, there's some creation and inhalation operator and there's some probability that happens and it's related to the mutual probability between things related to the fine structure constant, which is roughly one over 137. Or actually, actually it's quite funny because this, this guy, um, this is about the only real physics book that I have here at the moment. It's um, Fundamental Theory by Eddington. Uh, quite famously, originally, originally, measurements were on 136 and you spend a lot of time saying that it should be one, three, one over 136 exactly. 
then when better measurements gave 10137, he did some numerology on that. And it, it, it was a very sad thing in a sense, because Eddington at that stage was perhaps even more famous than Einstein to his contemporaries. And he lost a lot of that credibility through um, getting lost in some of his own mathematics. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about lost in maths as well. So, but the way that um, conventionally, if we're talking about quantum field theory, um, that you get an interaction between two points is that you consider all possible po possible paths between those two points, all possible cosmic paths that can take any route and consider, in, 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 um, and consider an integration over those paths, identical integration. And you find to your utter astonishment that such an integration pretty much excludes everything except the straight line paths between two points, together with perhaps a few wavelengths around it, but not very much. So interfering cosmic path paths from point to point are the way that a, that a, that a field theorist would um, uh, look at uh, the way that um, a photon forms uh, or any kind of quantum wave forms between emission and absorption. And if you want a, a starting exposition of that in the Feynman lectures on physics, and actually it's pretty, it's, it's excellent, of course, as you'd expect from Feynman. But this sort of process defines an effective straight line between emission and absorption in quantum field theory. I'm not going to go into quantum field theory, but that, just to relate it to that. Uh, so what does a rest massless photon do between emission and absorption? Well, um, it self-creates itself according to Maxwell's equations, and pretty closely according to Maxwell's equations, electric going to magnetic, going to electric, going to magnetic, in a, in a, in a, in, in a coherent way where it recreates itself to span all of space and all of time between the emission and absorption. And um, while, for example, in Linda National's talk, that, that what might happen is there might be interactions that are happening with those photons, the these will get reset, and there might be some quantum collapse things happening between the emitter and absorber. Uh, absorber. In fact, the phase coherence length for a photon in space is very, very large, and it can be cosmically large. It spans these things coherently large as it moves around. Now, where do inverses come into this? Well, inverses come into this because if you're talking about light, you're talking about fields, you're talking about bivector objects, you're talking about things that are a, a derivative of some vector, the vector potential in conventional physics, by time, by space, a curl giving you the magnetic field, a time derivative giving you the electric field. So the absorber and emitter um, are emitting some quite very complex thing. They're really emitting a 3D thing. And what the interference is doing is it's selecting those paths which are between emitter and absorber. This is our idea of why it goes in a straight line. It's not really, it's taking all possible paths, but the quantum interference of those paths is destroying or averaging to zero for most of those possible paths, except for the ones which are at an extremum, the shortest possible path, the principle of least time, the principle of least action then uh, takes effect, the principle of least phase if you want to go to the next level up or down from that. So the absorber and emitter, why must they constitute local 3D inverse of one another? Because what you've got is you've got some mass energy that used to be sitting on the sun, and it's cut, it's done something, it's emitted a photon, that photon's jumped across space and time, it's jumped across space and time, and that energy's gone bong and landed in your eye. There's been a transfer of energy from the sun to your eye. And to do that, for, for that photon to come in and your eye to quantum collapse that thing, it has to find an inverse for it. Because the only way to go from something which is a complex bivector field, which is distributed in three space, is to find something which precisely inverts that to give you something so that you have a thing times its inverse gives you a scalar. And if you don't have something which is at least of the form of the inverse, it's not going to quantum collapse that object. So we're going to talk about how these things, how the quantum collapse process is intimately involved with this idea of inversion. So now the, so the main theme of the talk is that the nature of the precise kind of inverse that you have in Martin mathematics is the key to the quantum collapse and understanding how quantum collapse works. So, um, but I'm going to look at inverses in this mathematics, and Martin found a general inverse in this particular mathematics, which gives a general invariant in its divisor, which exposes pretty much all the invariants you would like to have in the whole of physics, but also gives you a few new ones along the way. 
And there's a paper on that um, on the bicycle website. So if you want to download it and have a look and get some of the technical details, they're all on that. This talk's not going to be too technical. So here's the bicycle people. A lot of you will find yourselves on there if you look. Basically, the shorter the wavelength, uh, the short wavelength people have been my students at one time or another. The blue guys have uh, all made some sort of uh, impact on the theory, which is content to the theory, and then it goes down through a green who have uh, who've certainly had some influence on it and have helped, through orange who have also helped, but less so, uh, to red who have um, cheered me on all the way. So, um, but I want to talk before I start on this about mystification in physics, and I'm going to use somebody who can't argue with me here, Dirac, um, who is really one of my greatest heroes in physics. So I'm going to misuse Dirac's reputation, and this is partly for you, Peter, as well, because I know that both of us feel the same way about uh, about um, having begun to find some of the points, and there weren't very many for Dirac, where he might not have seen the whole story. But I want to look at a couple of bits. These are both taken from the fourth edition of uh, Dirac's Principles of Quantum Mechanics book. Uh, and you can see from the equations uh, that sort of section 69 and 70 in the book. Um, the first one is just um, an integration, a simple integration. Well, not that simple. It took me a while to understand it, I have to say. But uh, an integration of the equation of motion, the position of an electron as a function of, uh, of time. So if you look at that equation, equation 29, for example, you see the exponent is 2i ht over h bar, h minus 2, et cetera. That ht over, that h over h bar, it's just omega. E is H omega. So H is the uh, Hamiltonian operator. And uh, things like alpha one dot, are alpha one is, is, a, is a Dirac matrix, um, and uh, alpha one dot is the rate of ch change of that thing. What, but what this thing tells you, the maths tells you here, there are two terms in 20. First term looks like a complex or a hyper complex exponential, which is what it is. And the second term is much simpler. The first term is associated with a very rapid backwards and forwards vibration at twice the competent frequency of the electron. And this is the famous Zitterbewegung motion of the uh, electron. And the second term is just, the, is, is just a classical expression for the, uh, for, uh, for, for the classical relativistic momentum. It's, it's, not, it's just the thing moving MV, if you like. So um, this is Paul Dirac setting up um, an absolutely beautiful and wonderful view of what's happening inside the electron. But a few pages later, we find this. This is, uh, here's the page number and the section given explicitly. And he's looking to extend the operator, which acts on the uh, wave function that he's looking for, the spinner wave function, in this case, psi on the right. And he's introducing the electromagnetic field properly and fully. Here, uh, E is the electric field, that's given at the top of the page. Previous page will tell you that H is the magnetic field. Those um, matrices that are multiplying here are the four-dimensional equivalents of the of the Pauli matrices, and there's an H C over C in front of H bar E over C in front of that. But look at look at look at what Dirac is doing here. Here we're looking. He's got a operator here, which is which is he's exposing to us as the full operator, but he's not going to use it. Why isn't he going to use it? Because he doesn't understand the last term. He doesn't know what it's supposed to be doing. He doesn't know what it's for. And then, and this is entirely under act like, it looks more like one of my first year students when they first meet complex numbers. He says, hey, wait a minute, um, that last term's uh, imaginary. It's not, it's not real. So it should be some new physical effect. These extra terms involve some new physical effects, but since they are not real, they do not lend themselves very directly to physical interpretation, he says. And then what he does is he throws it out. And he works in the Heisenberg picture where that last term is missing. Now, the reason that utterly great man is having to do this is because he doesn't know what to do with it because he's already gone into the mist. And he's gone into the mist. See, there's that square root of minus one sitting there. He has quite a long way back in the book and in his development mixed up his eyes. He's mixed them up with what Peter and I would, would, would call quaternions or quaternion-like entries. He's got, he's used the eye for more things than one, things than one. And he didn't know how to handle that last turn. The second last turn gives you all sorts of lovely stuff. It gives you quantum spin. It gives you, it gives you a, a huge number of the important things that come out of the Dirac equation. But you know, Dirac here is being absolutely straightforward. He doesn't know what to do with this. And he just tells you that in proper 
gentlemanly physicist language. The book I learned relativistic quantum mechanics from misses out the fact that there's something missing. It just says, you know, after some tedious mathematics, one in, obtains the Heisenberg form. And thus things are perpetuated. Dirac is thought to be difficult. Most universities don't use Dirac for relativistic quantum mechanics. And in that case, most universities don't actually teach relativistic quantum mechanics. It's a waste of time passing on stuff which is not complete and doesn't expose the mysteries. The great people like Dirac, Feynman, if Feynman's got something he doesn't understand, Feynman would go, hey guys, look at this. I don't understand this bit. And he'll absolutely be dead excited by the fact there's something he doesn't understand. Why? Because he's a proper physicist and he knows that if there's something he doesn't understand, then there's something to learn. So that just says what I just said. Fourth term is spin, the fifth term is complex and it's just discarded. Right, now, look, nearly everybody uses a complex Dirac algebra, but it is completely possible to describe the uh, Dirac matrices without using the square root of minus one at all. And here's a representation in which that is done. The E's here are just gamma, so E zero is gamma zero, with a representation which has quaternion entries. So these are two by two matrices of what are, well, two by two matrices. So they're representations of four by four matrices. And they're exactly what you'd expect. The, the unit ma matrix is diagonal. Um, the um, the um, rotations, the, uh, the quaternion um, that, that are uh, isomorphic to the quaternions, E2, 3, E3, 1, and E1, 2, are just diagonal quaternions. Here, I, is, I, J, and K are the normal quaternions. I squared equals J squared equals K squared equals I, J, K equals minus 1. A real representation is perfectly possible of the gamma matrix algebra. To get gamma 5 out of this, you just multiply them all together and stick a, a square root of minus 1, a, a, a scalar square, a, 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 a unit imaginary in front of it. So you can do this thing perfectly well with quaternions, as you would expect. Quaternions are a kind of hypercomplex algebra that has three things that square to minus 1. So if we're thinking about understanding quantum collapse in terms of the current status of Copenhagen quantum mechanics, I think think everybody's going to have to say pretty much what, um, well, we don't know. Current state is a bit like this. Here we go. Schrodinger's cat is going to have to escape the box. And Peter Owens has book about that, which I've, had a, which I've read, which is great fun, so, uh, so I recommend anybody to get a copy of that. Anyway, look, it needs sorting, and that is what we are going to do. And we're going to do it in uh, lots of different ways. Peter's way, other people's way, Boo's, Garnet's, and me and Martin's, of course, we're going to have a go at it. Now, not all of these are going to be the whole story, of course, and different ones, then we're going to have different bits of the truth, I hope, and then we're going to eventually then develop something which really does tell the whole story and hence solves Hilbert's sixth problem. That's what Quisicles are aiming to do. Anyway, so here's Martin and my beginning of the story where we attempted to start to do this back in, well, we started in 1991. It took us four attempts to get published. This is from the fourth attempt in uh, an island of Louis de Broglie in 1997. The idea of what what's happening inside a quantum mechanical electron is that you've got a double looped photon sitting in there. And at this stage, we simply postulated that and looked at the consequences of that postulate. And doing that crazy thing without, we talked to people to try and think about how, how to combine it. In fact, Casimir, we spent a week with Casimir trying to think that maybe the Casimir effect might confine it. And we decided that no, for a spherical electron, which this thing is actually a picture, although it looks like a torus, it's really a sphere, uh, they would just crush it. So um, so that didn't work, but it was good fun trying. But what does it explain if you just say, okay, there's a photon that's somehow going round and round circles? When it explains charge, what charge is? It explains charge, you can calculate charge, one can calculate charge in terms of the spin, quantum spin, h bar, or vice versa. You can choose one or the other, we derive an equation relating the two. And the charge that you get from rolling up a photon, making it, rectifying its electric field and making it stick outwards, and then comparing that electric field with a, the charge, is about 1.6, 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, which is pretty damn close to the, uh, to the correct number. So it's exactly a half h bar, 
it gives you not only the gyromagnetic ratio that you otherwise can be calculating QED, um, but it gives you the reason for the gyromagnetic ratio. It has to do with something called a rotation horizon, which is just that the fact that things rotating with some frequency means that some bits of it can't keep up with that rotation and hence have to slow down. They got a spiral, we think. It explains the zip of Abum. Why? Because it goes around twice. This is a physical spinner that's sitting here. It explains the de Broglie wavelength and how that acts because it's a photon in a box generates the de Broglie wavelength. It's first shown by, well, de Broglie, really. So um, it explains also why the interaction is point-like because if you're scattering a photon off a photon, then you're not going to see a length of scale because the scaling of the inner photon is exactly the same as the scaling of the head-on collision of two electrons. So you never resolve an electron at arbitrary energy. It always looks just the same because the scaling of the innards of the electron is the same as the scaling of the thing you're trying to hit it with. So the relative sizes, the ruler clock for both, is exactly the same ratio. So it looks point-like. Not a point, but point-like. And it explains the uncertainty principle as well, because the uncertainty principle, if you've got an internal wave which is zittering backwards and forwards, David Hessenes wrote a beautiful paper in 1980 on this called the Ludwig Bacon Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics, where he derives the uncertainty principle amongst other nice things. So I recommend you read it. It's a lovely piece of work. But what it didn't explain, and you wouldn't expect to explain everything, of course, it didn't get the mass scale, and it didn't get what was making it go round and round in circles. It didn't get whatever was binding the electron itself. That's been the more recent theory. That's where we started. What? Okay, so I'm going to talk about inverses within a specific algebra. So I need to describe the algebra to a certain extent. I've again done this in previous talks to a certain extent. So I'm going to talk about the algebra of physical reality. Now, nature can't choose its math, the algebra of reality. There is only one, eventually. There is only one solution to Hilbert's sixth problem, if there are any at all. Alternatives are one or zero. It's complicated, but... I am convinced that it ought to be simple at root, and uh, I'm trying to put in as little as possible to get the simplest possible algebra out, which does as much as possible to explain how the photon, mass photon system confines itself in the physical electron. So uh, the way we started this is, is by a process which is actually taken from computer science, which is to try and make the elements that you put in as close to the physics that you understand as possible. If you put those elements in, just as when you're writing a program, you make you make some module which uh, uh, some object which, which which parallels what you want to do, then you can't do. If you get that right right at the beginning, the fundamentals right, then if you look at the way those fundamentals interact, the hope is that you won't be able to not do the same sort of thing in the mathematics that nature does in reality. So so a huge amount of effort. But Martin and myself went into trying to find a mathematics that really didn't look messy, that was simple, that was coherent, and that precisely paralleled the nature of space and time at base. And that process is still going on with people um, such as Innes, who's done fantastic work in having a look at different possibilities of changing that real changing that maths a little bit. Maths isn't one thing, maths is stuff you make up. It's and it's flexible. So and you try and bend it around until it precisely fits what reality does. That's that's what we're trying to do, solve that problem. And it's an ongoing process. So what's gone into the mass I'm going to talk about? Uh, how have we tried to sharpen it up? Well, one thing is I've sharpened up the principle of relativity. I call it absolute relativity in that I'm not going to allow any quantity to appear unless it's accompanied by its proper, in the relativistic sense, relativistic element. And I'm going to talk about local relativity, but the locality for light can be extremely large. It can be universally large. Light speed transforms the entire size of the universe down to smaller than well, of the order of a wavelength of the light. So, so depending on how short wavelength of light is, that can be very small indeed. Now, in this re algebra of reality, you have some not just objects, but you also have relationships between the objects, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. But all sorts of really nasty mathematical things start happening when you try and put physics into the maths. Why? Because physics is relativistic. And relativistic means that you're never going to be able to use a division algebra. And I'll say why shortly. Division. There's going to be places, there are going to be places where division is not described. 
defined other than the other than the simple one in real numbers, which is just the number zero. So, but multiplication still works. The vector multiplication in this algebra I'm going to talk about, and it yields an energy momentum density in a Hermitian square of the base quantities, for example. The cross products of elements of the vector base algebra, it's a four-dimensional algebra, time, space, space, space. The cross product of any two things with themselves yields a scalar, down one. The cross product of any two things with something different yields a bivector, up one, a two-index object. So if you've got lines, fundamentally, if you've got x and y, x times y is an x, y area. So this is the algebra of fundamental lines in space, unit lines in space, times each other, give you unit areas, a unit x times unit y gives you unit x, y. And um, a unit x times a unit x gives you the number one in some sense, but it's really the scalar one. It's really not a number. It's really a physical quantity which can have magnitude, just like going parallel, going perpendicular, we get something which can take that form, that aerial form can take energy density in the theory. Likewise, the vector can take energy density in the theory, but also the scalar can take energy density in the theory. So this is, this is which of course the real number one can also do, you can have one times seven is seven, for example. So let's know that it's, it's not a really crazy thing, this, but it does, it, it, I'm thinking in terms of a scalar, not a number. I'm thinking in terms of a line, so I'm thinking in terms of the scalar being a point as opposed to a line not a number as opposed to a line. But I'm not talking about points in a mathematical point, I'm talking about something which is, which can have size. Anyway, um, I don't want to get too much into that at the moment, we talked about it a little before, we'll talk about it a lot in the future. So, but the process is, the real process that we're going to talk about, the, the one talks about in the differential equations, which are constraint equations on physics, is, is not, a, Multiplication is in there, but the primary process tends to be a differentiation. If you look at Maxwell's equations, the linear equations, which are a vector differential of a vector to get you the fields, and then there are a vector differential of the bivector fields to get you Maxwell's equations. So one's talking about a, a, a vector differential process, and the differential is a special kind of division. dx by dt is in meters per second. It's in meters divided by seconds. An integration is a, is, a, is a generalized kind of multiplication, a differentiation, a generalized kind of division. And the interaction, so really need to understand division in this algebra if we're going to do differentials in this algebra, right? And differentials are what we use to describe dynamics. So most of the, the physics of what happens in our differential equation views of of, of nature, and that's pretty much in the Schrodinger equation, it's uh, the wave, wave mechanics, it's Dirac equation, it's Maxwell's equations. Um, these are linear equations, and we know what the solutions of linear equations are, pretty much just, here's a linear equation, what's the solution? It's gonna be an exponential, or something like an exponential. We know this, the mathematical methods of this have been done for about centuries, really. And th these interactions, though, interactions are also mediated by inversion of total distributions in my view, which is the main theme of this paper. And this is really the elementary process of quantum electrodynamics. But that's where quantum electrodynamics starts. I'm going to try and go to the beginning of quantum electrodynamics before quantum electrodynamics. Because in quantum electrodynamics, what you do is you just assume you've got some charges and that they can emit photons. And it's just a probability that you put in. And that's all that goes into the theory. But that's a fantastic theory. That's the theory you can calculate things with. That's the theory that gives you stuff to n decimal places that is not an agreed disagreement with experiment anywhere. So quantum electrodynamics is absolutely right in the sense that charges emit photons and it's good at calculating that, but it doesn't say what's happening underneath the charge skin, inside the elementary pro uh, particle, and also in the process of an elementary particle emitting a photon. How does that happen smoothly? There is nothing there to even think about that in quantum electrodynamics. So, um, so you can't. So we need to find something which doesn't start with that, but that leads to that in order to go deeper. That's what this intends to be. But I want to put a warning up. Some things you learned in primary school and that is just so deeply embedded in you as something that maths has to do, 
you have to forget about, you have to unlearn. And I'll come to the last thing here, the, thing, the, real, the, the, real, the real thing to unlearn is that subtraction cannot, isn't physical in many cases. In some cases it is, you know, if you've got one, you've got two beans and subtract a bean, you've got a bean, one bean, that's okay. But, um, but for, for, for objects that we're gonna talk about, like fields, that process doesn't conserve energy. So if you've got a field up and a field down, I mean, they cancel, so you've got zero field, right? But fields contain energy, so where did the energy go? That process of subtraction doesn't conserve energy. And whatever you want for your maths, you cannot mess with conservation of energy. That's way above any kind of mathematics that you might think to talk about with, uh, with any sort of dynamics. This is ultimate, this is absolute, forget about it. One minus one cannot equal zero for fields. It must equal two. You start with one lump of energy, another lump of energy, that energy's got to go somewhere. Where does it go? Well, it goes. It goes, it goes, into, the, it goes into the emitter and absorber, that's one way of looking at it. But the question is, it must equal two, but two what? What is the two that this thing equals? It's not a field, fields are linear. So what is it? Well, in this theory, it's mass. It goes into mass and it's mass exchange. It's, it's this process of division or inversion or subtraction that are related to one another. We're talking about, as Peter was talking about, when you have a nilpotent thing, you have, you have an operator, you have a vector or a multivector or a bivector or some, some, some object, and then you have an exponential. And the exponential determines what's happening with the differential. But then that process then has to fit with the vector to give something which squares to zero in the principle, nilpotent principle. Now, that's a very powerful principle because if you do that, what it means, it means the change of some stuff is equal to no change at all. And you immediately are conserving a whole bunch of the things that you need to conserve, which is why that kind of algebra is so astonishingly and beautifully powerful. But as Peter said, it doesn't have so much to do, it does have things to do with the exponential, but it, we've already got the essence of what's happening in the way that differential is formed, the vector differential, and the kind of vectors that, or bivectors or multivectors that you might have. So the algebra of physical reality is, is very much constrained by principles which are outside the algebra. It's not the algebra that's constraining stuff, it's, if you like, it's just common sense but it's actually what common sense is applied in a physicist way of looking at things in terms of conservation of energy, momentum, angular momentum, a hierarchy of constraints. So the constraints of physical mathematics and, and the things that we observe, that we measure, specifically the linearity of fields and the linearity of energy, necessitate that this mathematics does all sorts of things that mathematics shouldn't be made to have to do if it was a nice mathematics. The way Penrose puts this, he says, this mathematics is not very well behaved, he says, which is a British way of saying, well, you know what it's a British way of saying. How to build a quantum, so if you want to build a quantum mechanics, I've done this before, so I'm good. I'll run over this very quickly. The basic equation I'm looking at is d mu xi g is equal to zero. This is just a four differential of a 16 component multivector space is equal to zero. So it's a fairly complex thing, a little bit less complex than the Dirac equation in terms of the number of variables, 32 instead of 64, but uh, nonetheless, it's still pretty complicated. And here's what psi g can be. It's got 16 possible forms in which energy can play. So that psi p, psi zero, psi one in the last equation there are all numbers that express how much stuff there is in each component. And alpha zero is a unit vector in time, alpha one in the one direction of space, two in the two, alpha two, two direction of space, alpha three in the three direction of space. You can think of it as x, y, z if you like, but it could be r theta phi or any conformal orthonormal set, they all work um, the same way. Um, they just transform amongst these different things and they're transform what are they transformed by? Well, they're transformed by a differential. Well, they're not really transformed by differential, ladies and gentlemen, are they? I mean, what they're transformed by is they're transformed by a process. It's a process of transformation, which is a natural process of transformation, which is nature as it works. We describe with a differential. We describe for us as a differential of what's in it for us. How is this changing in space? How is this changing in, in, in time? How is it changing in X space, Y space, Z space, R space, C space, Phi space? If we go to r theta phi, we get, we, we all know how to solve these equations, spherical harmonics. Um, 
the solutions are in big books called by people like Grandstein Grand and, uh, and, uh, and Mawson Feshback. We all know where to look them up or can look them up on the web now as well. So the solutions are not difficult to find to these linear equations. They're pretty much exponentials and some harmonics, harmonics of a string or harmonics of a very cool bell or just harmonics of stuff that might ring. It's basically music. So, okay, so you've got one element, which is space, which is root, of root mass energy. That's the size, the small size in 16 space times forms. And if you do all that, you find that the subset of this four differential acting on the total field is zero. It precisely parallels all four free space Maxwell's equations. But if you put the whole thing in, um, well, one thing to note is that the, the four vector derivatives, look at the mathematical structure of these things. They are all infinitesimal inverses. There, there, there's something divided by a bit of space or a bit of time, but they all contain an inverse of the base, base element set. These are co and contra. And if you look at the, it varies in terms of the normal uh, parlance in, in, um, in tensor algebras. Uh, the thing multiplied by is co and the thing divided by is contra, for example. So the new theory encompasses Maxwell's and it operates on things which are um, lines, points. First one is a, reading down this list, alpha p is the unit invariant scalar point, it's the pivot, it's rest mass energy, it transforms as rest mass energy. That's not something you put in, that's something it just does. If you make alpha zero and alpha one, and alpha two and alpha three, unit elements of a Minkowski space, of a, of, a, of, of a relativistic space. And then their products, for example, d vector potential by d, d, t, d, x, d, y, d, z, that gives you the electromagnetic field. And those things have the form of bivectors. They are space divided by time as well, or space divided by space, in the space-time planes, space-space planes. Angular momenta have three indices. That's a momentum which also goes round and round in circles. So that's fundamentally a volume effect, space-time volume, space-space-time volume. Um, there's, there's something that acts like a source of angular momentum, and the, uh, which, is, which we call the hedgehog, which has an SU2 symmetry. It can be either inward or outward, it can either be up or down uh, spin. And there's an imaginary uh, rest mass as well, which um, is a, is a, is a four volume. So that's the mass that we're talking about. It's the mass of, mass of stuff you make up. This is the mass that Art and I made up. So if you do that, and then just do the, do, do the differentials, you end up with a set of equations on the right, which the first four equations encompass Maxwell's equations, but they now got some mass terms in them. They are like the Proker equation, equation with mass terms, but these are linear equations, first order linear equations, coupled, linear differential equations, just like the Maxwell's equations. And you also get four free, you get four new equations which couple charge to spin, which should not be a surprise given that you can calculate charge in terms of spin or spin in terms of charge. But there are four more constraint equations which must also be satisfied for any solution and which have until now not had anybody have a go at solving them at all. But um, they do tell you that certain things will happen. And one thing they tell you that will happen is that for example, a photon exchange must be associated with an angular momentum change. Wow. You can't get light out unless you, unless you have an angular momentum change. Like, you know, quantized photons have always been since the very beginning. These set of extra conditions here, the first one's a gauge, fifth equation, there's the gauge equation. The others, the next two, are coupling between spin and charge and current. They're constraint equations which are doing some of the things that quantum mechanics is supposed to do. And these are, this is an extension of the Maxwell's equations. So that's what those things are. So, um, but what do they do? What sort of solutions do you get out of these things if you want to start looking for solutions? Well, that's probably quite a big field for quite a few smart people to work on for a little while. It took quite a while to get solutions out for the Dirac equation. This one's even more involved with more, um, with more uh, possible terms. But let's look at the simplest one. Let's just put that first equation at the top of the page there on the right has two terms. One's the divergence of E, the other one's the rate of change of mass. It's how fast mass is coming in and out of the system. 
It's a mass exchange term. The left-hand term looks like the classical charge. The right-hand term looks like the quantum electrodynamic exchange of mass energy. That's an equation coupling classical to quantum electrodynamics. That's quite a nice little equation. So let's just look at that one and just put some mass in. This is what you do in the, in the Dirac equation as well. This is what Peter was doing in the Dirac equation last week. He's getting some mass in there to balance and make his system nilpotent. This is going in a different way. This is going in a dynamical way, not as just something to balance the beams. So here we go. Here's trying to do something with this. What you do is you take what you have first, top left equation, psi mu u, is, are the six components of the electromagnetic field. The extra component, psi p, is a rest mass root energy density in the scalar component that transforms as a rest mass. It's a rest mass component. What does it do? Well, it's quite simple. You just work it out. Uh, you obviously get the first equation that we had before. We've got the uh, coupling between classical and quantum electrodynamics term. But we've also got um, some, some, some equations that do things with curly Bs and curly Es that also associate them with an extra term, a gradient in the pivot, the third equation. So, um, so this is going to have an effect. What's the effect going to be? Well, to find the effect of this, what you have to do is you have to work out not what the base equations are, but you have to work out what the effect is on the form momentum density to see what happens to the form momentum density and that's quite straightforward um, you, ha you have an electric field divergence which is necessarily non-zero for these systems if there's mass there's charge the only way to get no charge is no mass which is fine that's the, exactly what you have in in in, in the standard maxwell's equations you need charge density to, yeah, divergence of E is minus rho over epsilon naught, right? There, you, need, you, need, you need a charge density there. You need to put something in. This doesn't put anything in except uh, natural dynamics of the transformations of the general equate, more general equations being presented above. So for flow and forces, you've got to consider the energy momentum density. So what does that look like? Well, just do the sums. You stick in the field. What you would normally do to get the electromagnetic energy density is do FF dagger. You do the emission conjugate of the field times the field gives you the energy, which is E squared plus B squared, energy density, and it gives you the momentum density, which is given by the pointing vector, which is E cross P. Put a pivot in there, put some mass term in there, and you get two extra terms. In the energy density, you get a very simple extra term. It's just, just like psi, psi, psi in quantum mechanics, it's just a mass density. It's a mass energy density, just what you would want. But the interesting term is in the momentum density. E cross B is perpendicular to E and B. You now have a term which is perpendicular to the original momentum term. It's another momentum term. You have momentum going perpendicular to E and B, and you have momentum going parallel to E. Now, if you've got momentum going like this and like that, you've got something which is going round and round in circles. That is a confinement term. And it's not just any confinement term. It's a hugely potent confinement term. It works out that confinement is not strong, and it doesn't need to be strong. It needs to be stronger than strong. It needs to be super strong. Because if you think that a proton is hard and the hardest thing there is, and it's held together by the strong interaction, then why is it that when we wallop an electron into it, it smashes it into bits, into tiny, tiny little bits which have thousands of particles associated with them, very high energy, while the electron you hit it with isn't touched at all. It doesn't even feel it. It's much stronger whatever's holding the electron together than what's holding the proton together. Just try banging the rocks together, ladies and gentlemen. And we've been doing this for a long time, but it's, it's so obvious that nobody seems to notice. I cannot get why people don't, don't just think, oh, yeah, what's holding the electron together? What could it be? Mm, is it electromagnetic? No, it's got a charge. It should explode. Electrons don't explode. Why don't they explode? Oh, well, maybe they have to go with something. Bunk stresses. Yeah, but what? Strong interaction. Oh, electrons don't feel the strong interaction. So it must be something else now, mustn't it? And this is stronger than strong. So physics isn't finished. We need to, anyway, whether this theory is right or not, we need to understand what's holding that electron together. Otherwise, we're just not doing the business of what we're supposed to do. So. If you want the forces involved here, well, that's pretty straightforward. You've got a momentum. You know how to get a force from momentum. You take a derivative, right? 
So um, actually, that's where we started. We actually got stuck on that for quite a long time. Nonlinear, <laughs> nonlinear field theories with 16 components lead to quite large. That's the equation, by the way, um, worked out by Innis, which is sitting as a background to the title page. And it, it, it's quite a lot bigger than the title page. It's got a page long equation. It's great fun to work with. Don't even try well, later, maybe. But uh, it's um, it's pretty nasty when you get into the fourth. It's pretty involved. It's not actually nasty. It looks actually very beautiful. But but, but it's it's quite a lot of terms. So you need to, you need to go through those terms. But if you look in those, if you do that thing, you find all sorts of things in that force, including what you'd expect. The Lorentz force density is is a big part of the uh, of the vector component of that vector force. But you also have tri vector forces, which act like kind of pressures in three D. You can think about that in, in the hedgehog term, and the 3D term as just being a pressure. But you know, you also have these sort of space time, spacey, spacey time pressures as well, which um, are a bit more difficult to interpret as a mere human. But nonetheless, it needs to be done at some stage. So, but those forces are balanced. If you've got a single particle, all the forces, the force equation must also sum up to zero internally. And in fact, a force equation is given by FDF. Uh, the field times the differential of the field, field times the uh, field times the current. Einstein had a look at this sort of thing quite extensively after he did relativity, um, and made a mistake there as well, which I can show anybody who would like to have a look. But um, or it, well, that that was pointed out by by um, by weight in uh, 1996. There's a beautiful paper called the Helmholtz uh, equation and solitons, where he Anyway, it's a, good, it's a good paper to really look it up. Um, so you end up with a new theory of light and matter. What does that do? Well, what that does is it gives you, as I said in a previous thing, it allows the linearly moving photons in a photo production experiment or an electron positron pair to go backwards and produce photons seamlessly in a single theory that describes both. And if you look at just the bivector bits, you get all four Maxwell equations with the right signs without messing around with co and contravariant because the division, the simplicity in the differential using absolute relativity takes care of that beautifully. So you get all four equations without introducing, an, without introducing a totally asymmetric tensor and without having to have a field in the dual field describing what's going on. This maths is far more beautiful than the stuff you can read in even the advanced textbooks. It does everything at once, just and no more. And it extends its extended equation, which has these mass terms, but it also has these couplings between charge and spin. And it has gauge equations. There are actually two gauge equations at the end of this equation, not just one. There are a pair of gauge constraints in the new theory, both of which must be satisfied for a self-recreating solution of a mass field system. And if you compare that with Dirac, which is a superbly beautiful theory, this one's even more beautiful. Dirac's got a square root of minus one in there. Mm, it's quite nice stuff, you know, square root of minus one. But and then it's got a d slash. Well, that d slash is pretty much identical to our d mu. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a four vector derivative. That's cool. That's good. That's a good bit. And then it's got minus m. You, you can put the i in front of the m as well, because it's still equals here. If you multiply everything by i or something, you can make it d slash minus i m psi is equal to zero as well, same equation. But look at that mass term. That mass term is a bit ugly. It's just a lump of mass. It's it's not involved in the dynamics, it's just multiplying psi. That's um, you know, you put some mass in there, why? Because um, there's some mass in the electron but it's not involved in the dynamics. It's just there to balance things. So you must have the mass, but you know, where's it come from? What's it for? What's it doing? How does it work? Well, that's not in the Dirac equation. This is why I think the new theory, which I'm talking about here is Dirac as it should always have been. It is a more beautiful equation. It's more powerful and it's in terms of things like the electromagnetic field, the quantum spin, the current, and not in terms of things which are mathematical constructs like spinners. It's a solution which is acting on fields and angular momentum and charge and current and masses. Now, these are things that, as an engineer, you want to have. You want a theory you can engineer with, not one which you can calculate some strange vibrations, but that have no practical purpose in terms of making new stuff. 
Now I'm coming to the main part of the talk, and uh, that's talking about the linearity of energy and square root energy density and local relativity, and what rulers and clocks are, what light rulers and light clocks are, how these rocks work, how these elemental bits of rock, how do they work when you bang them together? So what do we know? We know fields add linearly and so does energy. And it turns out that Viv gave a beautiful um, derivation of where relativity can come from, which is completely different to this one. But here's another one, another derivation of where relativity comes from. It comes to this. I think this one's even prettier, but I would do because I made it up. What I'm going to do is um, define a single scale factor of field, energy, frequency, length, and time. I'm going to describe that by the letter R. This is the relative scale of rulers and clocks in another frame. If you've got a ruler clock in one frame and you transform to a different relativistic frame, your rulers shrink and your clocks slow down. That, that scaling is a scaling that you can describe as a relativistic Doppler shift. It's the relative scale by which rulers and clocks shrink. It's the red or blue shift in terms of if you're looking out at the universe. It's the red or blue shift of a reference photon inside the moving frame. So a photon clock goes tick, tock, tick, tock, backwards and forwards inside a box in your rocket. And if you move the rocket, the rocket, you see it going tick, tock, tick, tock. Garnet, we to discuss this in uh, one of the Sunday talks a little while ago, so check that out. It's also exactly the scaling of a Lorentz transformed field. Fields don't transform like four vectors, they transform like fields, and that's how they transform. But briefly, because energy, goes, energy density goes as the square of the field, in order to get things to fit in and work, relative space and time must sh shrink and expand commensurately to preserve the linearity of both, because otherwise something's messed up in terms of the linearity of both. And to do that gives you exactly the Lorentz transformation, as I'm now going to show. So here they are. Here's what R is. The, 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 you can look these up in the textbook. These are in terms of beta, which is V over C the velocity in terms of the speed of light velocity, and the famous gamma factor, one over squared or one minus V squared over C squared. So here's a, a, the relationship between R and beta. R is, you can write it as one plus beta over one, square root of one plus beta over one minus beta, or you can write it as gamma one plus beta. You can write it as a division and a square root, or you can write it as a sum using gammas and betas. And okay, one over r, well, that's easy. It's one minus beta, square root of one minus beta over one plus beta. You can also write it as a difference, one minus beta times gamma. So you, you're writing these things in terms of something that looks like a division, even square root in there, and something that just looks like a sum. So, but the end result is that omega, omega dash in another frame is just omega times the red shift, the blue shift, r, this number r. Lambda prime is lambda divided by the red shift, same number, or blue shift where R is the relativistic Doppler shift. So if R is one, no shift. R is two, um, double the frequency, half the wavelength. R is, R is half, up the way around. That's what the R number does for you. And this is what the relationship is between those two things, just as you find in the textbook. But what's more interesting is, well, okay, if you look at the field transformation, you find out that it's just for a photon, exactly just this relativistic Doppler shift. It, tra it feels transform, not like a vector, they transform like a relativistic Doppler shift. But the really telling thing about this whole thing, and the far better way to write down relativity, in my opinion, and the way it should have been taught from the beginning at every university, is to do the inverse, the reverse transformation. What's beta in terms of R and what's gamma in terms of R? Beta in terms of R is R squared minus one over R squared plus one. Well, that's okay, that's a fairly straightforward uh, expression. But gamma is much more interesting. Look at the gamma we all know and love, the one over square root of one minus v squared over c squared expressed as r. It's a half r plus one over r. It's a half of something plus its inverse. And what is that? If you think about a photon in a box and r is one, then it's just half. Of, so you've got a green photon going backwards and forwards in a box. Then your energy is whatever it is, uh, the energy of the green photon. But if you move the box, then what happens is the photon going one way goes from green to blue, and going the other way goes from green to red. One half red shifts, the other half blue shifts. And if you add the red shifted energy and the blue shift, the red shifted energy can go all the way down to zero from one. The blue shifted energy can go all the way from one 
to infinity. And that's why the mass goes up. Because the red, the blue shifted part, well, let's just do a sum and do it in your head. So, 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 so let's imagine we, well, let's imagine we do a factor of two. R is a factor of two. So what you've got is you've got half the wavelength one way around and uh, twice the energy and vice versa. So the red shifted thing is now carrying half of the energy and the blue shifted thing is carrying double. So what have we got now? We've got double plus a half divided by two. What's that? It's one and a quarter. And that is gamma for that velocity. And it just keeps on going up. It's just simple sum. A much nicer way to look at relativity is in terms of the thing and its inverse. So the conclusion from that is that the light speed energy transforms like a rest mass. And you can look at some of Martin's work on this, uh, which is up on the website, and some older stuff called Light is Heavy with him and Toft a few years ago. So, right, so much for this function R. Now I'm going to use that function R in generating these wave functions. So in absolute relativity, you have to write the exponent. With absolute relativity, you've got this big rule, this absolute rule that you one may not put space down without putting a space vector in there. You can't write x without putting gamma 1 in. You can't write y without its gamma 2, and you can't write y. It's not allowed, and it's not allowed at the level of differences between sums and multiplications, or between multiplications and exponentials either. You've got to stick this stuff in the exponent too. You can't have a scalar exponent anymore. Well, you can, but you need to do some sums to do that. You need to find a way to do that. So, uh, and, uh, so here we go. So here's a wave, an absolute relativity wave function. Phi is some vector, y is zero. Now that doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily just a scalar. It could be a whole multi-vector. But it's e to the power of what? Well, we're going to have the normal thing. We're going to have kz minus omega t. But now the z is going to have to have an alpha 3, a, a gamma 3 then, in direct notation associated with it. And the t is going to have to have an alpha 0 because they are their proper unit vectors. And that's a horrible thing because it's not a traveling wave because alpha 3 squares to minus 1, right enough. So that looks like a traveling wave, sines and cosines. But alpha 0 squares to plus 1. And that means that looks like a falling or a rising exponential, which physically is always a falling exponential, right? So that's, we've got a falling exponential and a sine wave. That's not exactly a traveling wave that can describe something like light or, or the electron. So what to do about that? Well, you apply the same trick that you apply, you know, e to the minus theta is also a falling exponential. What do we do to that to make it wavy? With complex numbers, we multiply the theta by i. We do e to the i theta, and we all know that we get cos theta plus i sine theta and we get a wave by making, doing a complex exponential. But we can't do complex here because we haven't got complex. We've only got quaternions and stuff, and vectors and trivectors. So you need to find something that's going to make both those terms wave. And lo and behold, there are a couple of things that do that, and they're both volume-like things. They're not bivectors, not vectors, they are trivectors. And here is one. So if we multiply that thing in place of i by a unit vector in the direction of the angular momentum and direction of the propagation of that light, that's alpha 0, 1, 2, everything but 3, then we get a wavy thing. And what's it a wave in? If you just make x0 a scalar, what's the exponential part expand as? Well, it expands as 1 quarter mass, 1 quarter electric, one quarter magnetic and one quarter joule mass. Two, two terms that transform as a mass and two that are fields. Now, electrons have got mass and field. This is a candidate for an electron element of a wave function, but it's a four component wave function. It's a bit more complicated and it has two phases associated with it. One of them is a rate of change in time, omega, and then there's a rate of change in space, k. And they need to be different for massive systems because that difference expresses how fast the thing is going and the things that encode the energy and momentum for Schrodinger wave, for example. So, so far so good. It all looks as though it's doing the right kind of thing. Four component, a couple of masses, a couple of fields. So, but that's a bit like a bit of an electron. But now the magic happens. And the magic is that if you, pre if you change x0 from a scalar to something that looks like a photon, 
configuration, E perpendicular to B, same magnitude, and mag magic happens. So I'm going to change that X0 to a pair of fields, let's say, EX and BY. Here we go, EX and BY. And um, I put another couple of things in. So that's the alpha 0, 1 is E in the X direction, and the alpha 3, 1 is the E in the, is the B in the Y direction. Now forget about the, the R's for the moment, we'll just make R1 in your mind. Um, there's another thing I've done here, I've taken out the K and I've made the K equal to omega. And why I've done that, because it turns out that when I do that sum, when I multiply those two things, the mass terms cancel identi identically and I'm just left with field terms. I get a mass less, a rest massless wave function which oscillates. It looks, it's beginning to look a bit like light. Now, that, that R is in there for a reason. I'll come back to that, that in a minute. But there's also some normalization constant, which I've called H0, which is simply related to Planck's constant. And in fact, you can make that a universal content constant with your R. If you want your R just to represent a specific photon, then it's always just one. R is equal to one. If you wanted to represent every universal photon, then you can take R from zero to infinity and describe stupidly long wavelength things and gamma rays with the same formula. Or you could even, just by varying R on a particular photon, make it transform to utterly not there, almost not there at all, because it's transformed to oblivion, which is why it is rest massless zero. And you can transform it up to a gamma just by moving past it in your two spaceships that you, your friends have been playing with that morning. And um, looked at going into the, in, into the electromagnetic wave, it looks like a gamma. Going with the electromagnetic wave, it looks like a radio wave, same photon all scaled by R. In fact, that scaling by R, and I should say something about that because I put the R in there for the wave function, but really that R is really coming down from the exponent. It's coupled to the R in the exponent because we're going to look at equations where we have a differential in front which pulls down the R. So whether you look at the, this thing as being something which is an object, which is a process, or whether you look at it in terms of being a condition, putting the differential in there matters. This is a thing written as a process. In a process, if you have an object and you have something which is self-recreating, you have object, then process, you have pretty much the same object. The thing doesn't change. If you have condition, you have d object equals zero. What well, that tells you is change, the change in the object is zero, which is exactly the same thing that the process just said. Nilpotent and idempotent, just as Peter said last week, are related to one another. But... Um, You've, just, you've got to put some of your bits somewhere else to talk about what you're talking about. So this is a pure field photon-like wave function. It's a solution to Maxwell's equations in any Lorentz frame scaled by the single parameter r from radio waves to gammas. So that's a wave function. Apps. A photon. This is a photon wave function, ladies and gentlemen. That's supposed not to be possible. This thing scales relativistically, every single bit of it. And the reason why it's doing that is because every single bit of it is associated with its proper, its Lorentz proper vector or bivector or trivector or whatever vector. This is, this is, hey, there you are, it's one of them. Right, so here it is again, um, photon solution free space Maxwell equation. How do I know it's a photon solution? Because if you take that object and you four differentiate it, you get zero. So it fills d sine u, u equals zero. It fulfills the free space Maxwell's equations. But there's another way to find out whether it's a photon or not, and that's to take all the field components and split them all out and calculate what they are. And lo and behold, what you get is you get the textbook solution of a circularly polarized photon in, 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 in a medium advanced textbook in, in, in your local favorite library. So that just all works. Um, better than it works, it looks, if you extend it to 4D, it gets some lateral confinement as well. So it tells you why the Anyway, I uh, think it gives you another reason why the thing roughly goes in straight lines. It's, this is a pure field, solution to the Maxwell's equation, it's a solution to that equation, which is the Maxwell's equation, written not purely in the nilpotent form, because there's the, the different forms here, but nonetheless, it's a nilpotent equation. Uh, the diagram here, green is electric, blue is magnetic, and, and uh, red is the pointing vector E cross B, is the momentum density vector. So you get spiraling fields going through space. So if you look in space, you see a spiral, you see a sort of flying corkscrew, which moves forward. If you sit there in space and look at time, space and time act differently. What you see is you just see rotating fields. So 
field rotating as it comes in in, in, your, in, a, in a plane in space you see rotation if you move through space you see a twist so so what have we got we've got a photon localized only near the emitter absorber i'm about to come on to this bound by the precepts of absolute relativity into a form which is more photon-like than the usual solutions of Maxwell's equations. And that's because this algebra is taking you one into the regime where one's talking about things that go round and round, angular momentum things. And anything going round and round that's a photon is going to be limited by a rotation horizon. It can't be bigger than the speed of light around that circle. So as it gets more energetic, it shrinks. As it gets more energetic, it shrinks laterally because of that, as it get because of the rotation horizon. As it gets more and more energetic, it shrinks in the x in the direction it's traveling, in the z direction in this photon, because of the Lorentz transformations, the red shift, or blue, well, the blue shift in case of shrinkage, of that photon. Everything fits together properly, relativistically, because relativity is properly re built in right from the beginning in this algebra that we're using and developing. So and because the photon travels at light speed, emitter and absorber are always, in a sense, local to one another, at least in one frame, in the co-moving frame of the photon. So the locality of a photon is universal. And I'm not using that in a figurative sense. So what happens to emit a photon? Well, here we are. This is, this is an element of the electron wave function is given by that psi, some factor. X0 could be more complex than just a scalar. But um, let's just imagine it to be a scalar for the time being, times an angular momentum, a unit angular momentum, times a space-like and a time-like vector. Fine. How do we get a photon out of that? Well, we've got this thing, we've got this R factor. I'll just remind, I'm just putting it up there. We've just derived that, or we talked about that. So, and here's the photon wave function again. And so that's the wave function, which is sitting over on the right-hand side, left-hand side is the electron. So, and the energy of that thing is given by what? Well, um, it's just given by R times H bar omega. It's just given by E is H omega, as usual. R, R is, is one in the frame. If, if, if we're looking at a frame correlation, uh, then for the photon, you might, for the photon, one should take R to be one. But there are actually five frames involved in any such emission absorption. Let me say, let me explain very briefly. You have an, an electron, and that electron emits a photon. Well, that's a momentum that is thrown out. So the electron changes frame, it moves away. So you have the electron frame before emission and the electron frame after emission, which is different, two frames. And for the absorber, it's sitting there and suddenly it comes in and it's hit by a photon. So it was in one frame and it moves to another frame as it absorbs that energy momentum from that photon. Four frames. And then the fifth frame is the center of mass frame of the whole system. You can always find a frame whether or not the emitter and absorber are moving in which the emitter and absorber are stationary with one or another. You just sort of learn to transform into that frame. And then that is the absolute frame for the photon. That's what the photon sees. So five frames, photon frame, emitter before, emitter after, absorber before, absorber after. And what that R factor does for you is it allows you to switch between all of those frames just by changing that number. So this describes the whole process from emission, the process of emission, the process of emission, not the probability of emission. It goes from the wave function on the left to the wave function on the right by multiplication. Actually, of course, what's happening is you're taking a fraction of that wave function and you're changing it to being a lower energy. So you're just putting less energy into the emitter system, you're getting more energy into the absorber system. The emitter gets slightly bigger quantum mechanically, the absorber, once it absorbs, gets smaller. Energy is absolutely conserved, of course, at the same point in space-time because the photon brings everything to the same point in space-time. So this is an instantaneous process in, for the photon in the photon frame. No space and no time. Do the maths. So this thing is d mu phi gamma, where phi gamma is that thing is equal to zero. That's just Maxwell's equations again. And the two R's are coupled through the differential. I've talked about that already. So, But the conclusion is that charged systems may emit and absorb electromagnetic radiation for photon-like conditions. And that is, or is at least a process of photon creation and inhalation. And hence, if we consider the photon as a quantum system, 
and then we consider the process of absorption, that is a quantum collapse event. So how does that work? Well, let's think about it. How does that work? First of all, what is quantum? So the question is, what is quantum collapse? Now, Penrose talks about this beautifully in his wonderful book, The Road to Reality, from which um, I've taken this diagram on the left. And the idea is that you have some, some, some perfectly deterministic Schrodinger equation, evolution of the electron wave function, and then occasionally somebody goes in and measures it or something measures it, or it, it, it phase decoheres. And what happens then is you have some state reduction and you're into something else, and then having done that, and then it goes nice and linear and all deterministic again. And then it goes completely random and, and, and quantum mechanically indeterministic um, ex exclusion principle determined, bang, goes to some random cat half death state. So um, that's a theory of both of these things now, isn't it? So what is this quantum collapse? And this is a question that's been sitting around as a, as a monkey on the back of physics for a very, very long time, which I'm now going to try and give an explanation for. This is a great book, by the way, Penrose's book. Um, if you don't have it on your bookshelf, you should. It's not even expensive. Just go out and get one. And, and it'll take you a little while to read. It's a bit over a thousand pages. Oh, but Roger, by the way, if you happen to listen to this at any stage, could you get in touch, please? Of course, um, we have an unfinished uh, conversation as well. I'd like to continue. Anyway, so what is it about inver inversion that has to do with interaction? The fundamental reason is what I said before. If you've got some extended distribution, you need an inverse of that extended distribution in multidimensional space, in in, in a hyper-complex multidimensional space that's also distributed that can have any shape at all, although, as I said before, it tends to be stuff which is on the line between emission absorption by quantum interference. But it needs something to, it needs an inverse to collapse something which is a, you need the inverse of a field to collapse a field. You need field times one over field to get scalar energy, which is what's going from one, the emitter, to quantum collapse into the absorber. A quantum collapse is a taking in of all that energy that was the photon, and it's now just a bit of the absorber system. So how does that work? Well, you need an inversion. So how do you do this? Well, the first thing to do is try complex numbers and try complex number magic. Here's, a here's the Riemann sphere. Here's an inversion of the Riemann sphere. This is what it looks like. So and here it is uh, animated by somebody I don't know, but I think that Herodian person is the one who did this. If you did, please get in touch and I'll give you a better reference than that. So how does radiation work? Well, each radiating system is continuously in a state of being a potentially also an emitted photon. And it's seeking all over the universe for an exchange partner for the entire cosmos all the time through all possible interfering paths in all directions, which are all local for, the, for light, for the thing which is going to interfere to the point at which that process is taking place. So that's quite an unlikely process to happen. So this is why, you know, uh, it's a pretty unlikely event that that particular universe happened to find your eye just when you happen to be looking up on, on the 7th of June tonight, looking at it. It's pretty unlikely, right? But um, how does that work? It's a rare process of some sort, but because of the interference, it's at least overwhelmingly point to point, a line along a point. Look at the Feynman lectures. But apparently, if I go looking out and I look over the entire universe, I have me, if I'm just an electron looking out there, well, not electrons, electrons can't radiate by themselves, and let, uh, and a, a charged system, some sort of charged system which has the potential to radiate, then I must find my inverse somewhere in the universe. Now, we know what the probability of a mutual interaction is if you take out the geometric effects. It's the fine structure constant. It's about 1 over 137. So what we're saying then apparently is that for an elementary process, about 1 over 137 of the time, it finds a partner somewhere. Now, that somewhere is universal. It doesn't matter how far away it is. And what that's kind of saying is it's saying that the, that, that the number of possible partners the reflection of the entire external universe in terms of our interaction for a given that is coming through inversion. It's coming through looking for an inversion, finding the inverse to its complex distribution. And then that process can go, one inverse is the inverse of the other inverse. So the inverses themselves, the process of emission and absorption are also inverses. They must be.
they have to be for the cancellation to take place for the creation from a scalar to a field and subsequent collapse of the field wave function to the scalar so here's another view of the same thing that are showing dynamically if you take a bunch of circles and do their conformal inverse by inverting them in a sphere then you get the um, and that simple uh, exercise that i did here with uh, by computer conformal inverse looks like a slice through a torus or if you look the other way it looks like a slice through by by spherical distribution it's pretty much the same sort of thing that was just being shown in the animation before although we're now talking about a two-dimensional not a three-dimensional uh, well the surface of our atmosphere is anyway we're talking is two-dimensional so it's a, it's a different form of that same thing it looks similar as so it's the same thing same sort of thing the, the conformal inverse of a circle of a slice through a spherical distribution is also for any waves for any scale because these are a set of inverses these are all possible inverses if the emitter is very big universally big the thing that is going to the inverse is going to be very small and in the same direction if it's a vector and it's going to be different if it's a field which is what we need so we need to find the inverse for fields which we'll do in a minute and it's going to be different if it's trivector or whatever else but it's fields that are the most interesting because it's fields that are photons and it's photons that do the interaction over universal distances so we need to find an inverse as well as finding the geometrical inverse which this is we need to find the mathematical inverse which is what we're going to do next so let's consider that inversion let's first start with a four vector you put up a four vector and invert it what's the invert inversion look like well we need to find the same kind of trick as you do with complex numbers we need to find a divisor which is a scalar and if we do so if we want v to the minus one the simplest way to calculate it is to calculate v over v squared which is clearly v to the minus one and v squared is a scalar in this case and that indeed just gives you the inverse but what is v squared well, this is a relativistic algebra so v over v squared is v over c, c, ct squared minus r squared what's ct squared minus r squared for a photon it's zero that inverse is not defined on the light cone this non-division algebra has just bitten us it's bitten us by saying if i try and do a differential with respect to tau but there's tau is, is is the invariant interval in meters or seconds depending on which you to taste your units if you do d by d tau then as tau goes to zero, which it does, right? So you usually take an infinitesimal, don't you? Make tau go to zero. But this tau was already zero on the light cone. One divided by zero is infinity. And instead of getting a very, very tiny probability for that thing, you get a very, very much bigger probability for that thing, which is perhaps exactly what you need. The algebra is not a division algebra, and here it's hitting you. See Penrose? And him saying why well, this is a not a very well behaved algebra but inversion here is undefined but isn't that just what you want because how likely do you think it was that, that star would be looking out and just finding your eye just so click to make the contact very unlikely just like the infinite probability tribe in hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy you probably want a little infinity in there to make this kind of thing happen at all So the inversion actually is encapsulating the essence of the mutual relativistic scaling of space and time. And that is in many ways exactly what you need. And far from being not very well behaved, this algebra is then perfectly suited to doing the kind of things that humans observe, like now on a nice starry night. So I just said that, so, right. So, so we're talking about division, inversion, and scalar invariance, and what lo quantum locality means. So let's find what that inverse is. So I'm just going to show it. Here it is. That's the inverse for a field. So you take that thing and you spend, I think this one took us about a week um, eating, drinking, and being merry in beautiful Scotland on a hill above the sea. And you, after a bit of work, calculate inverse in different forms and uh, so um so the way to calculate this is 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 to look for inverses which turn out to be things like field squares squared fourth powers you need to get to an invariant for 
something which contains both the field and the masses. There it is, or there they are within um, one of these algebras that we've been looking at. And they're pretty straightforward. They end up being something like stuff cubed divided by stuff to the power of fourth. So to get to psi to the minus one for a field, you can't do stuff over stuff squared because stuff squared turns out not to be a scalar, but stuff to the fourth is. So you end up with something like um, the, the cube divided by the fourth power, which is an inverse. And that's what it looks like. But this, this division, the divisor here, is beginning to get um, important invariants in electromagnetism, like E squared plus B squared and E dot B. Invariants are coming out here, the kind of invariants that you need, that you want in electromagnetism. They're electromagnetic invariants. Here's an invariant that might be less familiar. Here's a, something which doesn't divide, which might uh, the divisor here, the scalar invariant divisor here, can also go to zero. And uh, this is this is a spin pivot Quedgehog combination. The, the Quedgehog is the is the dual is is the pseudo scalar element. But if you combine mass with spin, you also have a similar kind of thing that can go to zero under certain circumstances. And the mass spin thing, of course, is also something that you will consider in terms of exchange. So here's another invariant, which isn't so universally considered, but is nonetheless interesting. So, of course, the interesting thing for any, any mathematically inclined person is to find the general inverse. So here's a general multivector. And this took us a bit more than a week. Um, I think we're talking order of years here. Um, anyway, Martin finally, um, pretty much um, on uh, Martin Eustace's tech and worked very late, but he came, he managed to find this. He was pretty excited in the morning when I got up. And so here's a general inverse for any multivector in this Clifford algebra CL13. Here it is. And you can express it pretty simply as, as uh, let's put this up as well. Um, you can express this sim pretty simply in terms of a couple of conjugates. The dagger here is a Hermitian conjugate. And the Hermitian conjugate just reverses all things the square to minus one, reverses their sign. So um, that's pretty much like a complex conjugate then extended to the uh, Clifford algebra. And, uh, but there's this diamond conjugate thing coming in here that um, Martin invented that we need to use as well. And the diamond conjugate reverses the sign of everything that isn't a scalar. So the diamond conjugate of, 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 the, of the expression at the top is S zero minus everything else, including things that square to plus one. And that allows you to write this general inverse as a kind of a, a cube divided by a fourth power. And that cube divided by a fourth power will invert anything. It gives you all of the invariants that you need. It encompasses all of the usual invariants of, uh, of uh, relativistic quantum mechanics and of electromagnetism, plus some new ones for things like spin. And there's a paper on it in the Quisical paper in the Quisical workspace if you want to have a look. So and as I said, the general invariant contains a fourth power in the field. So that's coming to the end of the talk. The conclusions. So what are the conclusions? Conclusions are that the new linear theory of light and matter using Martin mathematics is uses Martin mathematics. Um, the photon self-recreation process is a coherent thing over cosmic scales. You have emission, coherent transport, quantum collapse, absorption. The four, the, the, the process of both emission and absorption is a coupling between a four, between a four element, or maybe is at least partially coupling between a four element wave function of mass and field as an element of the electron, coupling to a fully relativistic physical photon in a 4D inversion process, or if you like, an inversion of an inversion process, because you, you, you do an inverse inversion to create it, and then you do an inverse, and then you do an inversion to quantum collapse it, quantum creation, quantum collapse, decide the energy transfer coin. But the key to understanding interaction is then inversion, whatever that is. Okay, another question asking what the division means in this case, physically. That's an interesting question, which you can say something about maybe in the discussion. But the new thinking paradigm allows a description of both quantum creation and quantum collapse, which otherwise 
in any other theory in physics is unavailable. It's not something you can think about because the theories don't encompass it. So if you look at the inversion in Martin mathematics, this encompasses most of the known major variants in physics. They introduce a few new ones, just look at the paper. And that is the end of this talk. So I shall welcome, I'll stop sharing screens in a minute and welcome any questions.